So as you all know, in our journey of going against the current, swimming upstream, we have been uh, using the discourse on four foundations of mindfulness to support. And uh, why we say swimming upstream is because uh, what we usually do when we live is we just get bogged down in whatever that comes our way in our sense faculties and we just become victims to them. But when you walk on the path, what happens is uh, we don't just get victims, you don't just become slaves, you just see the process, right? So when we do that, we uh, swimming upstream rather than just going downstream. So uh, this was symbolized by the Buddha on the day he was enlightened by sending, people say, his ball up the stream after the breakfast. So anyway, coming back to our topic of four foundations of mindfulness, we have been discussing um, this for some time and we have covered more than 85%, 90% of the discourse. And at present, we are discussing a section called clinging aggregates. In clinging aggregates, at, as we have discussed in the previous sessions, I discussed about the form, we have discussed about the feelings, we have discussed about perception, we have discussed about mental volition. And in the last two weeks, we have been discussing about the consciousness, which is very crucial. And we have been trying our level best to do the justice in understanding consciousness, because you probably have to be an arahant to do the real justice to consciousness, because it is such a uh, complicated, or rather I would say a cunning mental uh, nature or mental process in our system. So um, just to recap what we have done in the last two weeks, um, should be able to remember, we um, discussed that consciousness is a polluted state of mind, right? What um, the blessed one says is, unless it is polluted, we won't be able to identify the consciousness. So it is therefore polluted by the sense faculties. Once it is polluted by the sense faculties, we call it consciousness. And when we say consciousness, we can identify consciousness only in relation to a sense faculty. So therefore there is no um, uh, unpolluted consciousness. So if it is unpolluted, it is not consciousness, then it is going to its pure nature, right? So um, therefore consciousness is something always attached to a sense faculty. So therefore we say eye consciousness, ear consciousness, tongue consciousness, nose consciousness, bodily consciousness, and the mind consciousness. So because of this special nature, if you take the Pali term, used to um, term consciousness, uh, which is vijnana, the word we means uh, special. And that special knowledge is um, what we identify or understand as vijnana, right? We mean special, jnana means the knowledge. So uh, if it is if, if that doesn't become special by this pollutant, then mm, we go beyond the consciousness. That is the job of the Buddha, right? He is trying to take the pollutant away. Once the pollutant is taken, taken away, then we go beyond consciousness. We go beyond the mm, attachment to the sense faculties. 
So, and that stay is in Pali called uh, um, Prabhava or the mind and the nature of the mind in uh, the discourses, what they say is Prabhashwara. Prabhashwara is uh, translated into English as luminous, right? It is so bright, but uh, the scholars and practicing scholars should say, they say the term Prabhashwara is not only having the meaning of uh, the brightness or the luminous, and it also says it is giving um, the uh, uh, origin or the prabhava, which means at the very outset, what the mind is, right? So therefore, before, before polluting the mind, we uh, go to the origin of it, and that is the real mind, which is uh, energy. So at the origin level, at the beginning, uh, when it is not polluted, and that is just an energy, and it is just an ability, it is just a possibility, it is just a potential that may change into anything by your sense faculties, right? So, therefore, our sense faculties, uh, the job of our sense faculties is to turn this energy into um, seeing, into hearing, into tasting, into smelling, into tactile sensation or uh, tactile feelings or into thinking, right? So um, once that keeps happening for a long time, we turn that, turn that into a man. We turn that it, we become so much in our basic of our uh, that origin has been there so many sorry i think i lost the connection in the computer um apologies for that so uh, actually what happens is it is not that this changing is happening at a very very fast rate and it is happening Recording every second and you won't be able to um you won't be able to notice so it is not happening it is not something uh, of course it is conditioned over time but this process is happening every time right every time we have completely a pure mind every time it is being polluted by something so since we have not go back to so many eons to clear it we can clear it right now and that is the that is the beauty of mindfulness and the mindfulness means uh, just um, right here right now so when when we uh, when we do things right here right now and we are able to purify the mind so um therefore uh, the blessed one says uh, mind is almost like or, or rather the mind not the mind the consciousness is almost like a magician and it is doing so much of tricks we don't know what is happening and my teacher used to say uh, even a better term i'm not saying he's he's above buddha my teacher says uh, the consciousness is like mafia boss right because uh, mafia boss is doing things and we don't he, he's he's hiding and uh, he's not involved in anything and all his um, followers or the assistants are doing the job and if you really catch someone and go back and find the mafia boss and he's sometimes the president of the country or the chief minister of the country and people won't believe that such a person is involved in such things so that's actually what is happening so because of that nature the blessed one says it is a magician and he's not going to possibly during buddha's time there were no mafia operations and also and also and there is another we discussed in the last um, session there was another discourse which is showing this 
um, cunning nature or, or the fl fleeting nature or crooked nature, um, pervasive, pervading nature of um, the mind. And that discourse is Nalakalapa Sutta. And in this Nalakalapa Sutta, we discuss that uh, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahakotita, if I remember right. And when Venerable Mahakotita asked, what is the reason for consciousness? And he says the reason for consciousness is name and form, which means name means mental process. Form means the physical process. And then he asked the reason for name and form. And then uh, Venerable Sariputta says consciousness. So there, in uh, we know the dependent origination, which we discussed last time, or rather, just uh, we just um, um, labeled it, signposted it. In that, it is being shown as a flow, but in actual or not in actual, in our day-to-day -day living, what happens is it doesn't flow exactly in that manner. When it comes to consciousness and name and form, it loops there. So it keeps looping like a factory and keeps producing. And then our existence is going. So this is what we discussed in our in our last session, um, or we are going to discuss the practice, how uh, Buddha is slowly, slowly breaking this uh, condition, conditioning or dependent origination. Right. So, does is see, touching the consciousness. If it touches the con consciousness, consciousness will show another magic. Right. So, therefore, um, the blessed one and there are people who have to start with the mind because that is the most important thing in our existence. There is no argument in that, that the mind, uh, at the same time, it is self. Uh, with uh, identifying what really feeds the divine, the most process uh, mental vision is feeding the conscious imagination, independent origination. Once again, and form includes. Uh, um, Feelings, perceptions, mental volitions. So, even in name and form, to have volition and consciousness. So, there are there are two things: two consciousness, and when the fear uh, in both the um, what happens is volition is blessed one um, try uh, tackle mental volition so when we were discussing mental volition you, uh, I'm not quite sure whether you remember, we discussed there are three types of mental volitions. Three types of mental volitions are um, uh, physical volitions, verbal volitions, and mental volitions. So um, in this three 
stages of mental evolution. If you take the hierarchy of how it works, mental evolution is happening um, first, and then it turns into verbal evolution, and then it goes to physical, uh, physical evolution. So first things are happening in the mind, the mind gets polluted, and then you uh, speak it, speak that or spell it out, and then you take the action, right? So I'm not going to give examples. So it is pretty obvious thing. You can think of plenty of examples for that. So um, um, unlearned worldlings, in other words, ordinary people don't know what is happening. They just dwell, uh, dwell in the verbal and physical layer only. They absolutely have no clue of what is happening um, below the water, right? They just see only the tip of the iceberg, which is verbal and physical layer. So the blessed one, therefore, starts from where the people are. We all were um, unlearned disciples, unlearned, unlearned worldly. Therefore, since we are with physical and verbal layer, Blessed one starts with the physical and verbal layer. How he starts with physical and verbal layer is he's saying in um, in four foundations of mindfulness discourse, um, go to a forest or foot of a tree or to an empty hut. That is his request. Why he is doing that is to challenge. Uh, where we are, which is our physical and verbal activities, right? So when we go to a forest or foot of a tree or come to a place like this, this is almost an empty heart. And we are challenging our eye faculty. There are, we don't see the things that we would like to see. And we don't hear things that we may have heard at home, right? Similarly, other faculties are also challenged. So in other words, we are challenging the physical activities. We are challenging the sense faculty. We are challenging the physical volition, right? When we challenge the physical body and to that extent, the consciousness gets disturbed. Consciousness gets shaken, right? So when the consciousness gets shaken, what happens is, um, the things that our sense faculties were used to um, target, right, uh, will um, jump up and will vibrate at the mental layer or the consciousness layer. So when you come here, when you come and uh, do your 45 minutes walking or 45 minutes sitting, and there is no not necessary for me to tell you what is going to be in your mind. So many thoughts are going They are basically images of our sense faculties. The things that we have heard, things, things that we have seen, things that we have tasted, and all these are, these are. So therefore, if these are coming up, it's a very sign that we, we have successfully attacked the physical volition. At its at its um, at its uh, initial layer, the basic layer. so um, the the sutta says they are for us or, or tree or put of a tree or to an empty hut and close your eyes, sit upright, and then start observing your breath. Right when you start observing your breath, and it says. Same Sutta says, mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out, right? So when you try to breathe in mindfully, when you try to breathe out mindfully, then um, it is introducing another volition. To do it mindfully, you will, volition means intentional activity. So you should have an intentional activity. When you try to do that intentional activity, um, this consciousness gets even more agitated. 
right? Because you are trying to, instead of jumping from eye to ear, ear to nose, nose to tongue, right? You are just trying to bring your attention to just one thing, right? So handle this agitation. Uh, the blessed one does is now he is using verbal volition. How he uses verbal volition is, is what I am teaching is mindfulness. Uh, when I teach mindfulness, what I ask you to do is to keep the mindfulness to the four. When you keep the mindfulness to the four, accept what happens in this particular point in time. So if you have thoughts coming up um, without any control, uh, and thoughts are overpowering you, and you are unable to bring your attention to the breath, then what you will have to do is you label that you thoughts are occurring. You label that uh, you are thinking, you are a thinker. So in other words, you don't write with the thought, with the impression or with the idea that you subside the thoughts and you should somehow or other take all of your nothing as such, you accept you as it is by accepting this um, thing that occurred, right? The, you don't intentionally think, uh, thinking is happening, so you just accept that. And it is happening, you can't just accept, therefore, you level it. And you be, you be saying, closing your eyes and holding your hands on your lap, and you are unable to see the breath. You keep repeating, thinking, thinking. You don't try to stop the thinking that is happening. The fact that you are thinking. So when you stop it, the state of the consciousness weakens again. Because you are not reacting. You are not intentionally doing something for what is happening, right? So uh, you are doing, of course, something intentionally, which is verbally accepted, right? So when you verbally accept it, uh, the, the situation comes to uh, a certain amount of uh, control. And then you may start uh, in breath happening, out breath happening. So if you are walking, you may be able to see movement of your right foot. So when that happens, then what you do is you start labeling that. If you are walking, you start labeling right, left, right, left. If you are sitting, you start feeling, if you see in breath, it happens naturally. You start labeling in, 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 when it is out breath, you start labeling out, out, out. So now gradually, it is that is happening in that particular. Sorry, um, the connection keeps dropping out all the time. Hope uh, you can hear me now. Um, so, um, when you um, use your verbal volition in, volition in this manner to take things under control, um, you may be able to have your attention uh, to a certain extent with either the walking or with the respiration or observing the respiration. And then when it is under control, what you do is you stop labeling, you stop um, naming it, right? And instead, you try to observe, right? When you stop labeling, when you stop naming, there what you do is you drop even the verbal volition, now, right? You drop verbal volition, and now you are with the um, mental or uh, physical volition that is happening without anyone's involvement, without anyone's direct involvement, 
right? Which is the breathing in and breathing out, which is walking, right? So um, you have reduced or you have minimized the physical activities that are happening from the sense faculties. You have um, um, stopped verbal volitions. You don't even label things now. You have come to the last involuntary action of the body, which is breathing. And only thing you do is you just keep observing it. When you keep observing it, you see the in-breath. Now you don't label, you see the out-breath. When you keep on doing that for some time, and I used to say in all my guidance to get as much information as possible. So when you try to get information of those things, uh, how you feel it and uh, how you feel when it starts, how you feel when it progresses, how you feel when it subsides and fades away and what happens to that over a period of time. You may see at the very beginning, um, it is very subtle. And for you to feel gradually, uh, when the breath is, breath is going through the nose, if you are observing the nostril, you see the whole um, body of air is going through the nose and gradually subside, right? And when, when you keep on observing this for some time, what happens is you become more and more, more and more close to this involuntary activity and the energy required to sustain your body is much less. So when the energy required to sustain the body becomes lower, your breathing in and breathing out also subsides. It also slows down. When it so slows down, what happens is your mind is getting more and more close to your breath, which is going into the body. So your mind naturally gets settled quietly with your body and it comes to a state, it may come to a state, you see, um, you don't see any longer breaths now, you don't see any gross breath now, you don't see any coarse breaths now, you see very subtle, very, um, uh, very shallow breath, right? And still, since you have the breath, you keep observing it, keep observing it, get more and more closer. As a result, you start seeing more and more, your mind is going more and more into the body. And you may perceive, you may um, feeling the whole body. When you feel whole body, where you still keep observing the breath while feeling the whole body, right? You don't get panic saying or thinking that you are losing your breath and you are seeing the body. And when you see the body thinks, this is not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do something else. I somehow should go and catch um, breath and should make it gross. You don't do that. You just um, settle with your body. You're feeling the whole body and the breathing is happening in a very subtle manner behind the scene. And when you settle in to the body like that, what happens is the breath even becomes shallower. It may come to a stage where you almost don't feel your breath and you feel settled and calming body, right? So when that happens, when you come to the stage of calming bodily uh, activities in that manner, which is the last involuntary activity that is happening, you are gradually going away from the last physical volition, right? And if, it's come, if it comes to a point, and a lot of people say, I don't feel the breath. I don't feel the breath, but I feel that I am living, which means you are, mm, you are, you have reduced a lot of um, input into the uh, consciousness to um, maintain the body. 
if you have input uh, required to maintain consciousness, which is um, either physical or verbal or mental volition, then um, this involuntary bodily activity will not calm down, right? So you have reduced that as much as possible. And then now you don't have even the physical volition, right? So there is a very important point that you will have to note. The important point that you will have to note here is that although the hierarchy of operational hierarchy of volition is mental, verbal, physical, when we go back, we don't go from physical, verbal, mental. Instead, what happens is we use verbal to tame both the mental volitions as well as the physical volition. And from the verbal volition, only uh, you take the physical, even the invol involuntary physical action. You can't say involuntary because when we are living, there is an amount of volition and amount of intentional activities involved in breathing. So even that unseen intentional activity in breathing also subsides, and that happens from the control that we take and from that we take from labeling, right? So uh, labeling happens first, or the, we we minimize the verbal volition first. And then as a result, gradually physical volitions subside, then the mental volitions are open, right? Now, only the big jobs start, right? So mental volition, uh, when the mental, when you go beyond in this manner, um, uh, from your physical process, then um, you, uh, challenges, there are a lot of challenges in coming to this stage. Physicality, we are going beyond the matter. When we go beyond the matter, when our mind comes into the body, we know our body is made of the basic elements, which is earth, air, heat, or rather the fire element. And what's the other one? Um, sorry, water, right? And there are certain characteristics of those things. So when the mind comes into that, those characteristics may come up. So when the mind comes into the body, some people may start shaking. Some people may start uh, rotating. And some people may start shivering. Some people may feel sweaty. Some people may feel nausea. Some people may, um, may have even sometimes loose motion, right? And uh, some people may feel very anxious. They, they can't fathom what is going on in the body. Mind is in the body. And this body is something which is living. And that living nature of the body, you may start seeing. So um, you may see that this is not a settled one thing. It is, this is like a beehive. This is like an, um, a, a lump of ants jumping up and down. Right, so um, you may you may feel uh, very unsettled when those things happen, and those are the challenges. So when you when you have those things, then it is definitely uh, the practice is going in the right direction. And anything that you feel that you are going uh, that your practice is going wrong, that is an evidence that your practice is going right. You say it is going wrong because uh, you don't expect that, number one. Number two, it is something that you are not experiencing in your day-to-day -day activity, right? So therefore, um, when you have those, the, when you, if you see these ch challenges, if you have these challenges, they are not um, something out of ordinary. That's very normal, very common when the practice is developing. So. Mm, if you go through these challenges, then um, the physicality is under control. You go beyond the physical volitions and then the mental volitions start. So when mental volitions start, the main thing that you will uh, see is you may see 
very strong uh, sense desires, especially lust. Um, or you may observe very strong aversions coming, right? Maybe you may see uh, so much of aversion towards very close friends, towards uh, our own family members. And I, when I was practicing, I was having aversion towards my brother. They haven't done anything wrong. But something must have been there inside. And I have been blasting them left, right, center in the practice. Right? And just can't, just couldn't stop. And even my mother sometimes. Right? And um, that aversion comes up. And sometimes you may feel lethargy. And you just can't raise your head. Right? Because you have, go you have gone beyond the physical volition. And therefore, the mind is not used to this situation. So you feel like you are drugged. Because we feel normal only when we have aversion or when we, only when we have sense desire. If those things are not there, we are not used to it. So you feel like that um, some injection is given uh, or some anesthesia is given. right? So you may feel that you can't raise your head. So that's again um, the action of the mental volition coming up or the agitation about the future or worry about the past or a lot of doubts about the practice. You may doubt whether this, whether this particular technique is right, whether this teacher is right, or Buddha is, is Buddha really enlightened. So many questions will come into your head, right? So uh, that's one way how mental volition will pop up. And the other thing is, you there may have a um, lot of uh, perceptions of um, or sensual uh, sense perception in the sense uh, when you sit and practice, although you close your eyes, you may see a lot of images coming up, right? You know, a lot of images of people, a lot of images of animals, a lot of images of places that you have never seen, never been to, and weird types of animals. Lots and lots of things will be coming up because now you're going beyond the mental process and verbal process. Um, the mind is trying to create something and drag your attention so that the consciousness can get established, right? So, and, and if that is not working, it may create perceptions about um, hearing. And some people say uh, they hear the sound of silence, right? You are so much controlled in your verbal and mental, uh, verbal and physical activities. And then the consciousness is creating a sound. It depends on uh, the nature of people. Uh, some people are very sensitive to particular sense faculty. So therefore from that sense faculty, um, you get um, aggravated perceptions, right? And some people, when they see those things, they write books about it. And I've seen a book called sound of silence. So it's, it's a very good practice when your practice is going well, only those things are happening. But if you write a book about it, you're hooked on to it, simple as that. Because it's, it's part of the mental volition. And uh, similarly, uh, some people get smell, right? Um, I remember when I, used to, when I was used to practice at home, sometimes I get very bad smell. I can, I can, I can um, perceive very bad smell. Sometimes I get very nice smell as well, right? So um, you may have those things and um, uh, they may appear to um, show that physical and verbal volitions are done now. They are dead. So they are trying to establish some mental process to get that, uh, to, to cling on to uh, the, uh, the, um, Consciousness and also something that happens here is having psychic powers, right? Since your since um, if your practice is going so well, you may have certain abilities coming up. You may feel that you are able to um, able to help other people, right? You um, cure other people, right? And relieve other people's pain. And in Sri Lanka so many of them, 
so many of them they get hooked and they get the ability they, on the following day they put a board outside i can do this and that there will have queues of people coming to see whereas it is it is possible but he has lost the practice right it's a it's a clinging on to uh, the 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 activities of the mental volition and um, the other thing that you may feel is um, you will get a lot of innovative thoughts a lot of innovations will come because you are not stressing yourself physically you are not stressing yourself verbally and even the mental state is very pure and in this pure mind a lot of innovations will come up right i remember i remember uh, i should not say this anyway um who is that guy uh, um, um the the uh, founder of tesla elon musk he used to say he will have to have um, what do you call those people mm. heroin he used to have a bit of heroin so that he goes to a stay and then he gets a lot of thoughts right so um so what he basically does is he is uh, he is uh, going away from the physical and verbal process and enter into the mental process and in the mental process uh, i'm not encouraging that in any way <laughs> it is not the right way um uh, there are a lot of innovations uh, happen right and um, in in my sessions there was someone who made a, he was a carpenter he uh, when he was practicing he has um designed an app for carpenter carpenters and there was another guy uh, he was writing a book and he has he has missed one chapter in the middle and in the practice what he has done is he has written that chapter right i remember when i was practicing long time back uh, initially when i was working in bahrain and we had some issue in the office and huge balance uh, unreconciled balance of a liability um people were spending months and months to reconcile it it was not happening and i was appointed as um, the 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 chief accountant in that company and then while practicing a thought came to my mind and to do particular thing uh, to 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 uh, introduce a new system to identify the transaction and then um, it in fact worked i implemented and it worked so like that innovations will come so again when those things are happening it's a, we may get hooked into that and what the buddha says is even when those things are happening uh, you will have to simply observe that it has a thought unless you observe that as a thought what happens is um we will be going away from mindfulness and we will provide the necessary conditions for condition uh, 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 consciousness to exist so therefore no matter what uh the buddha's word is ajanati ajanati means be diligently aware be diligently aware um irrespective of the story going in your mind just be aware that you are aware awareness will not leave you awareness will be with you all the time but you give yourself a certificate that you know it and you can you know these things because you have mindful right so most of the time we are mindful but we don't accept the fact that we are mind when we accept the fact that we are mindful we are diligent so therefore that diligent awareness is necessary rather than saying i have thoughts you have thoughts and you know that you have thoughts because you have been mindful right so you will have to give the credit to mindfulness then appearance of thought is not a disturbance it is a raw material for you to be mindful it is a raw material for you to weaken this um this cunning consciousness you weaken the mental volition that may come up to strengthen the consciousness so in that manner 
um, you, you don't provide the nutrients and the consciousness uh, will not settle. So you go beyond, therefore, uh, now you have already gone beyond the mind uh, or rather the mm. physical process of matter. Now you can even go beyond the mind. So if you, um, if you use uh, scientific terms for this, you go beyond matter, which means atoms, uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, and things like that. And you go beyond dark matter as well, which is the absence of uh, aversion and the strong desire, right? which is the darkness. And you go dark matter as well. And you go beyond dark energy as well, because um, you will have to observe that lethargic situation. When you observe that lethargic situation, you may go beyond dark energy to escape from this matter energy phenomena or physical mental phenomena. And so Buddha said, therefore, to Bahia Daruchiriya, Bahia Daruchiriya was someone who, uh, as soon as uh, he saw the Buddha, uh, he immediately felt that this person is having some message. And Buddha was going on, uh, going on his arms round in the morning with the begging ball. He said, please teach me what you have. And then uh, Buddha said, this is not time to teach. I'm hungry. I'm, I will have to go and have my meal. But he kept on asking. And uh, finally, the Blessed One said, um, or rather the Bahia Daruchiriya said, if you don't tell me now, um, if I wait for you to come back, who, who knows whether I will be living? Who knows whether you will be living to come back? And most importantly, even if both of us meet, I may not have some trust in you. So I have some faith in you now, so please teach me now. So for the third time when uh, he heard that blessed one said he was in a hurry. So he gave the Dhamma in very short. And he said exactly what we are discussing now in four sentences. He said, in seeing, only seeing. In hearing, only hearing. And in tasting, smelling, bodily contact, only that. And in cognizing, only cognizing. Which means when we see something, we not only see it, we keep on building up a story about it. It is nice and I should have it and I should buy it for my brother, my sister, my family, and I should give it to the whole world and we build up a story. But Buddha says, you see something, only seeing. Right? So you don't, um, the consciousness is there. But you don't uh, allow the consciousness to have any more permutations and combinations. Right? We call it ditte ditta matta. Right? It doesn't go any further. And then when Buddha was coming back after his arms round, this person has been killed by a cow. And he has become an arahant by the time he was dead because he has been contemplating, he has been practicing while walking, right? So he had, in his past lives, in Jataka stories, Blessed One says, um, he has had lots and lots of perfections. So therefore, he was the fastest person to realize Dhamma. And um, so, although we have come to the um, end of the five clinging aggregates, this particular chapter we were discussing is not to teach about five clinging aggregates. Right? Of course, we have taken most of our time in teaching what form is, what feeling is, what perception is, what mental volition is, what consciousness is. But this chapter in Four Foundations of Mindfulness is not to teach that. What it says is, for all these five, such is consciousness, or such is form, such is feeling, 
right? Or such is its origin. Such is its disappearance. That is what the Blessed One is teaching in Four Foundations of Mindfulness. That these things are not permanent. They arise and pass away. You have no control over these things. And these are, these are having uh, only links to dependent origination. He is not directly telling those things. He is asking us, when it is there, you be aware of it. When it arises, be aware of it. Don't fight with it to chase away. Or don't try to cling on to it. Whether you fight or whether you cling on to it, you give a value to it. As soon as you give a value to it, you come into the picture. The self come into the picture. You try to make it permanent. You, tr you try to go away from the understanding that it happens for a reason. It's that there is cause and effect relationship. So that is the message the Blessed One is giving in these four foundations of mindfulness. And not that he's trying to teach these five things. We have taken so many, so many weeks to understand it. So I went into the, uh, detail of it because then we can know what these things are. And now finally I'm telling this knowledge is not important. When you have a feeling, be aware that there is a feeling. When it disappears, be aware that it disappears. When it arises, be aware that it arises. Feeling, perception, pollution, anything. You may, you may have a lot of intentional thoughts coming up. Just be aware of it. And whatever that appears will pass away. Otherwise, you try to make it a life. Give it a life. That happens when we are not mindful enough. Right? So the message in Four Foundations of Mindfulness uh, in observing phenomena is not to teach any of these things, but to understand impermanence, non-self, and dependent origination. So I hope I've done some justice to the Buddha's message in Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And may you all have the courage to go beyond these five clinging aggregates and challenge the consciousness. Blessings of the Noble Triple Gem. Um, I think I have taken... Um, bit longer time, partly due to Chatu's uh, delay in drinking water. <laughs> and partly due to, um, I had taken a bit of long time to explain it very slowly. And uh, anyway, we have a few more minutes. If anyone is having any questions or comments um, about the talk or about the practice, we can take some time. Sorry about the continuous disturbance um, to the connection. Fortunately, once again, Chatu was the savior. <laughs> yes, yeah, just. I have a question about the elements, like uh, when you. And into some stage, you mentioned that you start to feel that elements. That's uh, something like a dukkha satya, like a, it's like a pain, or like a, if because uh, if you like those five elements, like if something prominent, like air or something like a, uh, then warm or uh, those are uh, can feel it as like a pain, like a kind of be focus on pain uh, how you get away from that stage like... yeah it's a good question um, um, Buddha says what to do in that when that happens right what he says is pajanati it's not trying to get away it's not trying to make it better if it's a pain it's pain in the neck, fine, but accept it. Because pain happens because, as you said, uh, because of the appearance of the um, of one of some one or some other qualities of the elements that is there in our body all the time because our body is made of those things. 
right? And the fact that you don't like it comes from the mind. So if you keep observing it, you change your attitude towards that. That is, that is uh, the teaching of the Buddha. He's not trying to eliminate anything, get rid of anything, exterminate anything, which is our mind. He says, train your mind, which is possible, to accept it. And it is difficult initially, but very much possible to a human being. Did I answer the question? Yeah. yeah. The reason today we sit actually, I fight with these thoughts so long mm-hmm. and uh, trying to trying to surpress so, uh, the thoughts uh, because I am aware with uh, with those thoughts like last uh, couple of years in my practice and uh, fed up with that. And then uh, the, the biggest thing I couldn't do is like uh, um, aware of these thoughts while this happening uh, keep awareness of this thought process as like a putting light into this but I always feel that if I put that light that's again some of the other thought process and therefore I I try I I didn't promote that like uh, the, the because I, I believe that it's a part of a thought and therefore I I didn't I don't know how to uh, really look into that thoughts without tangling or just like a, a flowing river. You're just looking it at it and you don't get angry or anything. Uh, what I try to do is like, I thought that's I'm part of that thought process and uh, trying to either stop it. Uh, when thoughts overwhelm you, um, then you lose uh, trumps in the pack to play right so um, you forget what the buddha has said just to be pajana and um, that is because of the sheer speed and the volume of the thoughts that are occurring and then at some point you get the right tool which is observing it and your mental volitions are so strong at this stage and it is suggesting you being aware of that is also a thought, right? And it is um, accusing you, right? It is accusing you to say that you are not following the path. And the reason why it happens is because you become aware of that with an objective of stopping or eliminating this thought process. It is the aversion towards the thought process that makes you to be mindful about the thought process. And so, the, the, therefore, uh, the, the issue is not with what you do, but issue is with the motivation of doing it. The urge that you have is, can I suppress this somehow? In, in, in Buddha's teaching, we don't suppress. We let everything ooze out, but happily, close your nose. It is thinking. Close your nose, but just keep observing. We know the thoughts that we have in our mind. They are so stinking. Right? We can't tell people in public. Right? So bad. Right? But you can observe. Right? You can observe without any expectation. Then, mm, uh, then they lose the strength. But you brought a very good point there. The point is, this observation is also another mental volition. Right? But you should not accuse yourself for making that mental volition. It is suggested by the Buddha. Right? Um, and he said, following the path itself is a mental volition. But that mental volition is not to cling. But that mental volition is to renunciate. So you should have some volition to renunciate as well. Right, so and and that renunciation path will be open, and the mentality of renunciation is developed. So once you achieve, you can kick off the path as well. Otherwise, you hold on to the path. 
right? So therefore, uh, the, my teacher used to give a nice simile. He says, when you go up in a ladder, if you want to go up, you will have to cling on to the one on top and then, and then leave the one that was below. So that is what we are doing. You're clinging on to or, or, or use another mental volition to um, renunciate a stronger mental volition or unskillful mental volition. This is a skillful mental volition. Not to say that we should hold on to skillful mental volition as well. So that's an important point. So you, you are dying, doing the right thing, but um, you have um, possibly um, perfectionist mentality or possibly um, um, seeing that you yourself um, as a victim of things, right? So we will have to get rid of all these interpretations that we are giving about our practice. You will have to discuss, disclose your practice as it is to a noble friend. Then he will be able to help you, right? So it's, it's going well. When it is going well, um, you feel that it is going bad. That is the trick of the practice. All right. I'm 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 sorry. You know, I I am fine. I'm still uh, trying to get my go over, get over my <laughs> aches and pains and the <laughs> various right. things I asked last yeah. time. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. It's it's as I said last time. You don't uh, try to um, eliminate them or remove them or or, or uh, come out of them. You will have to accept yourself, which is the pain. Right, so every, uh, in one sitting, just increase one second of bearing it up and it will accumulate over time. And all of us have gone through that. And I remember I started five minutes, my practice was um, five minutes and initially started. And five minutes was five years for me. Right. But it came, to, it came to a point that five minutes was nothing and then immediately increased to 15 minutes. And then 15 minutes started to feel like one year. And when you increase to half an hour, I thought that I'd never be able to go beyond half an hour. But um, continuing, uh, persevering and patience is the only thing. Don't, don't try to observe it with the objective of eliminating it or removing it or getting rid of it. But with mere, mere motivation to accept yourself, which is right. the pain. So when you accept yourself, you become happy with yourself, you start loving yourself, that itself is the change in the attitude. Right, yes, thank you. Yes, I today um, I could go halfway through without changing my posture, so I feel very, very happy today. Yeah, good, I'm good. Improved. Yes. Yeah, yeah, keep on doing that. And it is very much possible. Thank you. Right. All right. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, um, we can pass the positive energies that we have generated in the session to the um, beings in the universe who are able to receive them. And our teachers, monks in the temple, and those who look after the teachers and the monks, and whoever who is looking after us, and our family members who help us, and whoever who is putting their time and energy to organize these things, and any living being who sees these things and rejoices in what we do.